What's up again guys? Yo it's me, Dovahkeen, and welcome back to my Anno 2205 miniseries. And before we begin, be sure to hit on the subscribe button for more great videos. Okay. In the last episode, I showcased the stock market. Portions of my economy, specifically my credit balance and population. And my roadmap, the path I took on acquiring sectors. And based on that path, the sector that I started on is Wild Water Bay, which came with the self-titled Free DLC. With a buildable area of 100,000 acres, this sector contains the largest island. Making it, arguably, the best temperate sector in the game, the ideal place to build your mega corporate city, which is exactly what I did. Anyway, if you didn't choose to start in this sector, which is a stupid decision in my opinion, you have to attain the required corporate level and current cost first. By the way, this screenshot doesn't have anything to do with my playthrough, so the values indicated here, required level of 16 and required credits of 1.3 plus million, is just for a level 1 corporation. The actual required values are dynamic, increasing depending on your corporation level. On a side note, the current owners of acquirable sectors, in this case, Yuzo Yev Incorporated, are random for each playthrough. Also, the sector trait in this screenshot, Slate Terroir, is bullshit. But you can swap that out for something better once you own it. Alright, Let's load up Wild Water Bay. Anyhow, I have more than enough entertainment supply in this sector, so the stadium icon is just a bug. This southern island is gonna be your starting area here. But buying the eastern island, the biggest one in the game, should be your priority ASAP. Build here as you wish, but once you have raised enough funds and resources, move your residences to the big one. I left this one empty, except for a few algae farms, cause I really don't need the space. However, if you don't wanna burden your logistics supply on the big island, you can build some of your facilities here. So yes, depending on the number of factories, building them on smaller islands is more logistically efficient than on larger ones. Okay, now to my mega corporate city. The design of this entire city is based on the size of each individual cluster. There are 8 conventionally shaped clusters in this city, and the rest are just fillers. The worker and operator houses at the bottom left, and those surrounding the corporate HQ, which if added all together, would have roughly the same tier 2 needs as a full-grown cluster. So theoretically, there are 9 clusters in total. Now, this is the housing cluster layout that I used, not just here, but for all my temperate sectors. It has an area of 53 by 87 tiles and has an 87% space efficiency rating. There are 84 residential complexes and 22 residences, or smaller houses. On public buildings, it has three infodromes, two security departments, a metro station and a stadium which are more than enough to supply the service needs of this cluster. So yes, you'll have a little bit of surplus on services, to carry over and supply adjacent clusters. Furthermore, in regards to goods consumption, utilizing a cluster layout, helps you estimate how many factories you have to build in the future. Let's say that you need to construct two rice farms, with complete production modules, to support one cluster. Thus, if you're planning to build five clusters, 
you would need 10 rice farms. Anyway, the space occupied by the stadium is flexible. If you have the Orbit DLC, you can swap out the stadium for a launch pad, the Biology Institute. And I have two clusters with those setups. On the other hand, as I've intentionally excluded talking about this in my previous episode about the stock market, you can also swap it out for a trading floor instead. Which according to the description, grants additional promotion rights depending on the number of residences in its surroundings. But I'm not really sure about the influence area mechanic, because as soon as you construct it, you can promote any residence, though far away, as long as it is within the same island. Speaking of which, I have three clusters with trading floors. By the way, you might have noticed, in this trading floor configuration, that I can still squeeze in a few more houses in this layout. But as I've said in the last episode, for better aesthetics, I'd rather leave those spaces alone for green zones instead. And speaking of green zones, my corporation HQ sits in the middle of one. And as I've said earlier, it's surrounded by just tier 1, or worker houses to make it stand out from the background. The centerpiece of my mega corporate city. This design uses up all 30 allowable HQ modules, so this is as big as it gets. Also, I could have used the Empire Headquarters skin, which is one of the rewards you'll get from the Ubisoft store for purchasing the ultimate edition of this game. However, that doesn't tickle my fancy. Too white for my taste. The normal one looks better in my opinion. By the way, I don't have any other corporation HQs in other sectors, making Wildwater Bay, the capital of my corporation. Alright, let's visit my production areas. My rice farms are at the southwest. My microchips and flax fibers facilities are at the southeast. There's nothing special about my microchips production, but for flax fibers though, this is my general layout. Four flax plantations in a block, but of course, modify this depending on the number of buildings that you actually need, and available space. Next, northeast of that is my construction materials factories. Biopolymers and Constructo bots to be specific, and again, nothing fancy here. Just take note, that besides here in Wild Water Bay, I don't produce biopolymers and Constructo bots in my other temperate sectors. When I need construction mats elsewhere, I just export them from this sector. Now, at the northeast, you can find my IntelliWare and Vitamin Drinks facilities. Nothing notable for IntelliWare, but for Vitamin Drinks, this is my universal layout. Each block contains two vitamin condensers that are supported by two fruit plantations. By the way, in case you haven't noticed, all my production layouts have maintenance modules. Those that provide bonuses to workforce, energy, logistics and credit maintenance. The ones for credit maintenance though, financial calculators to be exact, are all in my lunar sectors, cause I don't have any energy production facilities elsewhere. And, as you can see, my modules aren't ordinary. They are all branded modules which provide way better bonuses, and I've already detailed how to get unlimited numbers of them in the last episode about the stock market. Anyhow, always consider the inclusion of maintenance modules when creating your production layouts. Okay, let's jump to the north. Located here are my synaptic circuits, androids, replicators and multi-spec prisms factories, and there's nothing special about their layouts.
Next is here at the northeast where my rejuvenator's production is situated, and apparently, I have some sort of fancy layout. Each block is composed of two biomedical laboratories, which are supported by three synth cell incubators. As per maintenance modules though, unlike my other layouts, facilities here don't benefit from having the maximum five out of five. Some have only two each, while others only have three. But I guess that's a necessary sacrifice, for better space efficiency and aesthetics, right? And lastly, we move far north to my luxury food production. There's nothing notable on my vineyards, cattle ranches and food design workshops. For my soy farms, however, this is my simple layout. A block consists of two soy farms, and eight maintenance modules, four for each farm. Okay, that's it for my production layouts. Now, before I talk about the details of this sector, on a separate note, despite of being the largest island in the game, I only have five transportation centers on it. And as I've mentioned earlier, I could have used the other three smaller islands to cut back on logistics, but again, I don't need the space, so I left them untouched. The point is, I was able to lessen my transportation centers, whilst significantly decreasing my energy consumption, by fine-tuning my branded modules. Alright, let's start with sector traits. I started this sector with one of the best random traits, Terra Preta, which boosts the productivity of all farms by 10%. You can geo-engineer sector traits by spending credits, iridium and graphene. But as I've said in the previous vid, graphene is the most precious rare material. Again, I started this sector with Terra Preta, and I was able to do that, cause I forced it to spawn on Wild Water Bay, upon creating a new corporation. If the random trait that you want, doesn't appear on the sector that you are choosing, just close and restart the game until it does. You need to have a lot of patience, but I tell you, it's worth it. And speaking of rare mats, the reward of Wild Water Bay's sector project, is Iridium Generators, of which periodically fill up with a capacity of 75 each. So you have to check up on them from time to time. Show's over, so it's sayonara! And this questline is given to you by Trenchcoat, a merchant NPC, who also appeared in the prequel game, Anno 2070. Obviously, he's long dead already, that's why you're just interacting with his hologram. Now this is the entire questline. Take note of the tasks that involve goods. If you're wise, you don't have to produce them at all. Once your spaceport becomes level 2, or what we call a global spaceport, you can simply buy those goods from the global market instead. By the way, I'm gonna talk more on that later. Anyway, as per the hardest quest on the other hand, it's step 4 under phase 3. Maintain an energy balance of 10,000 for 15 minutes. Obviously, it's virtually impossible to accomplish this without a level 3 spaceport, officially called a transmission spaceport, which allows you to receive energy from your fusion reactors on your lunar sectors. Of course, your moon spaceports should be transmission spaceports too, so they can beam energy down as well. Okay, before we go back to the strategy map to discuss transfer routes and the global market, check out my goods panel here in Wildwater Bay. Wildwater Bay supports the needs of Akia flows, namely, vitamin drinks, luxury food, 
diamonds and replicators. It then gets its arctic needs from there as well, specifically, neuro implants and quantum computers. As per the moon on the other hand, it supplies mare relictum with rejuvenators, IntelliWare and androids. And in turn, receives its rare earth elements, bio-enhancers, anti-grav compensators and energy supply from there. Wild Water Bay is the goods hub of my temperate region as well. Any surplus goods from other sectors gets forwarded here. On the contrary, if there are deficits in other temperate sectors, Wild Water Bay also acts as the supplier. So, let me refresh you on the goods panel that I've shown earlier. Even if Wild Water Bay is my temperate goods hub, Surely these massive numbers couldn't just be from other sectors surpluses, right? And mind you, I have never overproduced. As I've already showcased in my last vid, this is the result of considerable production bonuses from share and takeover benefits, upon owning all my rival corporations in the stock market. Incidentally, the goods that have zero surplus in this panel, are the ones that I'm currently selling to the global market. Now, as indicated in my balance sheet, my world market revenue is a whopping 800,000 plus. Anyhow, world market and global market are one and the same. And again, I was able to achieve that without overproducing. You see, selling to the global market is actually impractical in the beginning. To sell goods, you need to have significant surplus, and in order to have that surplus, you need to overproduce. Overproducing goods is expensive, cause you need to build more factories, that naturally require credit maintenance, workforce, logistics and energy. And if you do the math, the amount you've spent to sustain those extra facilities, versus your global market revenue, would most likely just barely break even. So, selling to the global market only becomes viable, and overpowered in fact, once you have taken over your competitors in the stock market. Alright, in the Roots Overview panel on the left, you can clearly see the 13 goods that I'm selling, arranged according to highest revenue. And if you look to the right, I have reached my root limit of 13 out of 13. The normal root limit is just 10, but after finishing the sector project in the Madrigal Islands, of which I will feature on a future episode, you'll get three more. As per the global market itself, it's not stable. Goods prices may change within a span of 15 minutes. So selling a certain good may be profitable now, but not later. A world trade route lasts for two hours, and Anthony Goodwin here, will ask you if you want to renew a route, near the end of its duration. If the price fell so much, and you're gonna get way lesser revenue, just let it run its course, until it expires on its own. Then just choose another good with a better deal to replace that route. Lastly, on the cost of transfer routes. Routes involving only temperate sectors will cost considerably less than those involving the Arctic region and, most especially, the moon. Some players try to save credits by limiting the quantity of goods, hence only using the smallest and cheapest transport vehicles, but end up making multiple similar routes. That's good advice in the beginning, but when you reach the point of having nearly a hundred routes, that approach is gonna be a management nightmare. Just cut yourself some slack by creating routes conventionally. After all, losing some money, in exchange for invaluable convenience, is fine. And there you go. So, like how this video started, now let's end it with another spectacular drone shot.
And, that's all there is for now. Thanks for watching. Also, check out other videos from Sabbath Clan Philippines and don't forget to subscribe. See you on my next vid. Peace out ya.